Hello, and welcome to episode 26 of St. Luke's Gallery. The purpose of this site is to share my appreciation of sacred art with you, and hopefully to persuade you to look at art in general in a new perspective. Today is the 6th of December, and it's the feast of St. Nicholas, Bishop and Confessor. Ask the average person on the street today who St. Nicholas was, and the ones who don't look at you with a clueless expression are probably going to say Santa Claus. For this episode, I'd like to spend some time on St. Nicholas in sacred art, illustrating who he really was, and why this feast day during the season of Advent is one we should appreciate and ask for his kind intercession in our daily lives. I'm going to break protocol with this episode, and rather than run down a bio of one particular artist, I'm going to instead devote the bio section to St. Nicholas himself. He's sadly largely known today in the Western world as Santa Claus, but we owe it to ourselves to educate ourselves about this great saint. Very little is known about St. Nicholas of Myra. He's believed to have lived from the year 270 AD to 343 AD. He was born to a wealthy Christian family in Asia Minor, which is today present-day Turkey, during the time of the Roman Empire. After a pilgrimage to the Holy Land, he became the Bishop of Myra, and is credited for acts of charity towards his subjects. At the First Council of Nicaea in the year 325 AD, he famously punched out the heretic Arius for being, well, for being a heretic. He's attributed to obtaining several miracles during his life and afterwards via his intercession. And today, St. Nicholas is the patron saint of sailors, merchants, archers, repentant thieves, children, unmarried people, and students. Let's start off with this 13th century icon from the Novgorod School in Russia. It's no doubt been touched up several times over the centuries, but it's a fine icon on many fronts. Note how St. Nicholas is looking over towards our Lord on his right. Typically with icons, the subject is looking directly at you because icons are supposed to be a window into heaven. But in this case, I think it's a nice variance because rather than have the focus completely on Nicholas, it's not so subtly pointing towards our Lord, which is how St. Nicholas would have wanted it. To his left, we see the Blessed Mother, and on the left and the right, we see the Twelve Apostles. Moving ahead to the 14th century, this is an excerpt from the Degray Hours now on display at the National Gallery of Wales. Here we see St. Nicholas in a scene from one of his attributed miracles. During a famine, a butcher lured three children to his house where he killed them and placed their bodies in a barrel to cure, planning to sell them off his hand. Nicholas, according to the legend, visited the area, saw through the butcher's lies, and with the sign of the cross in his prayers, obtained God's mercy to resurrect the children. As horrifying as the nature of this crime was, it took hold and spread widely throughout the late Middle Ages, fostering devotion to St. Nicholas, and, in an ironic way, led to him becoming a patron saint of children, which in turn became an inspiration for the modern-day Santa Claus. Here's one of the more well-known events in the life of St. Nicholas, and one that also led to him becoming Santa Claus. This is the Dowry of the Three Virgins from the 15th century, and if you're not familiar with it, it depicts the seat of three sisters from an impoverished home. Their father did not have a dowry for them, which meant that the women were unlikely to marry, and likely destined to be sold into slavery or prostitution. Word of the family's misfortune reached Nicholas, who was a wealthy man by way of inheritance. One night in secret, he tossed a bag of gold into the house of the three sisters via an open window, and that landed inside a stocking hung by the fireplace to dry. The first daughter was subsequently buried, and not long thereafter, another bag of gold appeared, allowing the second daughter to marry, and then, upon the third bag landing inside the house, the father of the house, staying awake, discovered it was Nicholas, and Nicholas instead begged the man to keep his identity secret and to instead thank God for providing the gifts. Gentile de Fabriano is the artist, and this painting can be found today in Rome at the Pinacocheta Vaticana. Remaining in the 15th century, what you're seeing here is part of a much larger altarpiece that was painted by Bici di Lorenzo for the St. Niccolo di Cafaggio in Florence. 
This is St. Nicholas of Barry, not Mira in this case, banishing the storm. In this dramatic depiction, we see a merchant ship, ship caught up in a rough storm with the crew tossing cargo overboard to lighten the load. We see one of the crew members praying to St. Nicholas for help, and there he is in the upper left responding, bringing the clear skies with him while the dark stormy clouds subside. Note how while St. Nicholas is coming towards the distressed ship, if you look in the lower left, a mermaid is swimming away from the ship. What's up with that? The mermaid in historical lore, prior to Hans Christian Andersen, represented the dangers of the sea and the pagan creatures that Christianity had defeated. Actually, prior to Andersen's book, The Little Mermaid, mermaids were depicted as horrific demonic creatures, but that's a tangent for another day. And now let's jump over to the 18th century with this fine painting by Ilya Repin, depicting one of St. Nicholas's many acts of charity. During the time of the Emperor Constantine, unrest and revolt was a way of life, and three generals were sent to put down a revolt in the Asia Minor region of Phrygia. On the way, they came ashore in Andriaki to buy bread and other supplies. Seeing an opportunity, local mischief makers impersonated the soldiers, looting and causing mayhem. The townspeople mobbed the real soldiers, thinking they were the cause of the trouble. Enter Bishop Nicholas of Mira, who, upon word of what was happening, rushed to the port to restore order. He did indeed restore order and invited the generals to return with him to Mira. As they approached Mira, people came to Nicholas, informing him that if he had been in the city, three innocent men would not have been handed over to death. Nicholas probed in finding out that the three men were still alive, asked to be taken to where they were being held. Nicholas got to them just in time as they were about to be beheaded. Not a passive man, St. Nicholas took control of the situation, freed the men, and took them to the Praetorium, where he confronted the prefect Eustathios for accepting bribes and almost causing the deaths of the three innocent men. The frightened Eustathios confessed his sins on the spot and was pardoned by St. Nicholas. Peace was restored to the troubled area. St. Nicholas Saves the Three Innocents from Death can be seen today in the Russian Museum in St. Petersburg. This is one of my favorite paintings of St. Nicholas. It's by the Serbian painter Uros Prenik, and I think it captures the spirit of this legendary saint well. We see him in his priestly garments, confidently posed with the sacred scriptures in one hand and the crucifix in the other. You can imagine him persuasively confronting heretics without one iota of fear. It may be hard to see, but if you pay close attention, you can see the faint halo around his head, which I think is a really nice touch. And here's a close-up of Uros Predic's painting for your further appreciation. St. Nicholas, pray for us. And that concludes episode 26 of St. Luke's Gallery. I'll have a new episode soon, so until then, please visit stlukesgallery.com and also the channels on BitChute, Vimeo, Rumble, or YouTube. Questions or comments can be sent to mail at St. Luke's Gallery. Thank you again, and may God bless you.